Hi everyone, this is Dave Gray. Uh, as some of you know, I'm working on a book called Principles of Agility. And I'm very excited today to have Erica Kochi with me today. Erica is co-founder and co-leader of UNICEF's innovation uh, team. And uh, you can find out more about them at unicefstories.com. And you can also find uh, Erica on Twitter at Erica Kochi. That's E-R-I-C-A-K-O-C-H-I. -I. Welcome, Erica. Hi, Dave. Thanks for uh -huh. having me. Yeah, it's really good to have you today. So um, tell me a little bit about your team, the, the innovation team at UNICEF. So uh, UNICEF Innovation uh, is a small team in New York uh, of about 15 people. Uh, we have 14 innovation labs all around the world and a, a small unit in San Francisco, which uh, I now head up. And we look at helping uh, our uh, programs on the ground in over 135 countries integrate technology, design practice, agile practice into their work to strengthen the way that UNICEF delivers health programs, education programs, water programs, etc. So we're really looking at not just technology for technology's sake, but trying to use it as a tool to improve um, what are existing, you know, long existing programs on the ground. That is awesome. Okay, so I, I know you have a lot you can teach us, but maybe uh, a good place to start might be, um, do you have a, a, any f stories that you really enjoy telling about successes that you've had in uh, really changing the world? I think one of the best um, stories that sort of I have sort of harks back to how we develop these principles. We have these, prin these innovation principles, which... Uh, are built on many, many failures, and sort of they, they are there. Uh, you can find them on our website under the principles section. And the first principle under that is uh, design with your end user and design for your end user. And I think you know we found we found this out the hard time many times. We built something in New York that we thought would you know be amazing and change the world, but then it just wasn't used or it didn't. It didn't work. And so, you know, after a couple of those times, we realized that we needed to, even if it was going to be a little more costly up front, we needed to work directly with our users. And that meant, um, for one project, uh, getting a team of developers, designers, a project manager to go live and work in northern Zambia, which is um, very, very remote, about 20 hours drive away from the capital city. Uh, to to build to work and build directly with community health workers who were going to be using a, a system to get HIV results back to very very rural areas, and I think it was really through that process that that sort of eight week iterative process that we realized that what we had designed um, would have looked nothing like what we actually came up with had we not been there. Oh wow! Well, so. Uh if you don't mind me asking, what did it originally look like in your head, and how did it how did that change over eight weeks of uh, being on the ground in, in in Zambia? So essentially, we were we were trying to solve uh, this problem uh, around early infant diagnosis of HIV AIDS. So essentially, uh, if a mother is HIV positive, and in Zambia there's a really high rate of HIV, so there are a lot of women who are HIV positive. There's a chance that even if she takes uh, drugs to prevent the transmission of the virus to her child, she may still transmit it. And so what you need to do is once, an in, once a child is born, you need to wait about six weeks to test their blood to see if they're HIV positive or not. You need to wait this six weeks because um, before that, the child will still have the mother's antibodies in, in its body, and therefore it, it could be testing falsely positive. So if the child does have HIV um, and it, it doesn't get on treatment within one year of time, its chances of dying go up by 30%, and then by the second year that becomes 50%. Okay. So essentially timing is really of the issue. Mm -hmm. So what the, the problem is that to test for HIV, you basically you prick a child's heel, and then you put this, the blood onto sort of what looks like um, a, a business card. And which is a special business card which has areas for the blood. And then you collect all of those, and then you need to send it to the central lab. 
And so for Zam in Zambia, in this very, very rural place, that was 20 hours drive away. So you can imagine, like, things get lost moving in the supply chain upstream. And then by the time they get to the lab, they need to be tested, and then they have to send the results back. Yeah, wow. Not just to the community, not just to the clinic, but they have to go find the mother that these results belong to. So you can imagine all the different steps in the process, and it's a logistical nightmare. And so, well, I can imagine it's a nightmare. I can't imagine all the steps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are many. You know, I mean, it's not you have to gather these things up. It goes through, you know, to the, to the clinic, and then it goes to the district hospital, and then it gets on a motorbike, and then it gets on a, you know, <laughs> a, a, a truck, and eventually, hopefully, ends up. So there's no sort of checks and balances along the way. And so initially, what we thought we would build is, oh, well, Clearly, we need to, um, you know, just get. It's, we can't do anything. Else. We have to get the physical sample up the stream. There's no way that we can really, you know, replace that with technology. However, we can re replace the results going back with technology. They said, oh, okay, well, we will just build a system that, you know, sits at the lab and sends the the clinic um, the results back, right? And then, you know, be, because these are you know, HIV results, then we'll have like a passcode on it, so only the person who, like, you know, has the passcode can actually retrieve the results. So, and essentially we did build that, but what we realized was that that was only part of the problem. You know, a big, big problem was that, you know, mothers would come back to clinics and their results wouldn't be there, and they would have had to take a day off work to walk, you know, to the clinic. Um, and then, you know, that, that happens once or twice, and you're like, the results are never coming back. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't sort of really weigh in the people factor. And because we were there for, for eight weeks, we, saw, we started to see sort of some of the, the relationships between people, technology, information, and, like, the daily stresses of, you know, tr just trying to deal with a, a broken system. And so what we really ended up designing was, obviously we designed the thing that comes back, but we also designed a system that tracked the sample up the chain, so we knew where it was, um, you know, as it was moving from, you know, mother and child all the way up to the central lab. We also built a system to, um, of reminder systems that would sort of remind, once the results came in, it would remind community health workers to go follow up with these mothers and say, and let them know that their results were ready and so they would come back. So they didn't have to waste time uh, constantly going back back to the clinic. But all of these things, uh, I mean, it's much, it's more complicated than that, but all of these things were really observations that we had while we were working there and talking to people and looking at observing how they how they conducted sort of their daily life and what were their major pain points uh, around these issues, and I think even though that was sort of more costly up front to have that many people out there for eight weeks, it made all the difference in the world, and it meant that we developed a useful and scalable solution from the get go. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. That's amazing because I mean, you're you you had a. <clears throat> it sounds like you had a hypothesis going in. You had an idea, um, and then you one of the things you you did was you put people in the situation to before you actually built it. Though is that right? Yeah, I mean, we build a bit a little bit and then test it out and see what happened. You know, with people who are actually going to have to use it, build, test. You know, very like agile. Agile development processes. Okay, so you actually you had a, you had the con you had a conception, and then you built it. You went there, and over eight weeks, you built, delivered, built, delivered, and kind of just iterated it till you till you got it to where it was working well. Yeah. And then we let it run for six months, and you know we had all the sort of data because because all the data happens over mobile phones, like using SMS, mm -hmm. so like just text messages, very simple. So we saw. You know, we did what we could in eight weeks and got a system that was very functional. But after that, we had that six months of data. We could then see, like, okay, actually, we could improve. We could improve it even more. And, is, and user feedback during the building, but then we had six months of data to figure out how we could improve it further. Well, yeah, okay. So how? I mean, how do you know when you're done, or are you never done with something like that? Is it? Can, well, I think. Um, 
we figured out how to deliver results back, and uh, we I think figured out like what works in terms of reminder systems to get um, women to come back to clinic to to the clinic to get results and other like essential health interventions. And we actually use that reminder function across many other countries and many other areas, not just in sort of HIV at all, because we realized that the um, sort of time and communication barriers and distance barriers that people face uh, in rural areas are very similar. Um, doesn't matter if it's around education or water or, or other health initiatives. They are incredibly similar. Uh, you know, you're really looking at, and looking at how you can use technology, especially mobile technology, to overcome some of those time and distance barriers. So you can think of it almost as, some, as an alternative to getting on a bicycle or in a truck to, to go somewhere. And you can yeah. use that technology to as that communication and as that as that reminder so you don't physically have to go somewhere. Um, and so I think it's, what's interesting is that that eight weeks of research has paid out in so many ways and we automatically deploy that reminder system now uh, with, with so many things and across so many other areas. Um, and no, it never ends. Basically, there's always more you can do. Right. Okay. It, uh, but uh, at the same time, you're saying, I think, uh, what I'm hearing is that you've um, there. There's no way you could have known when you made that initial eight week investment that you would come up with something that would be so powerful and so globally applicable. Um, am I right? Or you know? absolutely, we had we didn't know. Um, I think we were hoping that we would come up with something because we were making this investment that we felt would pay off mm -hmm. in the long run, but we there's no way we could have predicted. That's really, I mean, that's really interesting, though, especially considering, you, you know, being a global organization, as uh, there are a lot of global organizations that are trying to make things happen and innovate and do things. Um, uh, to, to have something and be able to, in eight weeks, come up with something that then has you find has global applica applications all over the world, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, so, that's and that's only one principle. That's one principle. <laughs> but it's, I think the most important, it's probably the most important one. To be co-creating with people and actually be building things with them, alongside them. Yeah. Um, being, yeah. Be working directly with customers in a very participatory way. Exactly, yeah. Were you there for that one? Um, I was not there for, for that particular one, but we had a team of uh, designers and developers. Um, yeah, I'm just I, curious. I, I mean, I uh, the getting the money part and the, <laughs> and the politics well, part. <laughs> I'm curious uh, when you do that. Um, maybe there are other kind of similar things that you've been involved with. I mean, how many of the ideas actually come from the customer, for lack of a better word? Um, how many of the uh, or how many of them come out of conversations, or how how do those ideas um, what's the best way to get, you know, do you have any thoughts or tips about what is a good way to get those conversations going, get people involved in it? You mean to get sort of the, the idea that, that, that brings the, a product together? Yeah, let's say, I mean, you, you're working with people alongside them. Do you have any thoughts or tips about how to get people to open up? Uh, how do you get people who are not designers uh, to participate in the design process, ways that you can make it... Um, uh, you know, get them to be able to, I mean, pe get people to be more willing to donate their time, uh, their enthusiasm, their energy. Um, do you have any thoughts or tips on? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, um, well, I mean, one thing that our, our team uses is uh, sort of shadowing people through their daily work life. So, for example, for community health workers, well, you know, our, my team will just often just watch them for you know half a day or a day and see like what their what their day day looks like. And I'll be obviously always thinking of like where can I use uh, technology or where is there somewhere that we could shorten this, make this less painful uh, for for them. Mm -hmm. uh, or what technologies they might already be comfortable with or using and things like that. Exactly. I mean. Also, I think from the technology side, what's interesting is looking at how they use technology. So uh, in the same project, actually, 
we were thinking like, oh, well, we can for de we're designing a mobile solution. We can only use do this for clinics that actually have cell phone reception. And while cell phone reception is very wide widespread, um, in some really rural, remote areas, there still isn't uh, cell phone reception, like in the U.S. Right? Mm -hmm. the yeah. um, and so what we found, so we initially thought like, oh, we just won't include them because there's no way that we can use the system. They have no reception. But actually through talking to them, we realized and just observing them, we realized that they actually own cell phones. And we're like, well, why do you guys own a cell phone? And they're like, well, I go into this larger town once a week, which has cell phone reception, you know, to get groceries or, you know, sell my things or, you know, whatever. Like once a week I go into town. And during that time, that's when I... Um, retrieve my messages, I make my phone calls. And so what we realized then was like, okay, we can actually include them, but we need to make a system that works, um, that doesn't require a constant back and forth. It needs, you need to be able to sort of, even you can send the message while you're, don't, while you're not in reception, but it needs to be okay that it, it then again gets, gets saved in the outbox and it, and it gets sent once you come into the reception. And so we needed to design a system that worked asynchronously. Yeah, like the old days when you, uh, when you had a modem and you'd upload your email and uh, exactly. download your messages. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think, um, so I think, you know, observation and um, look at what they're already using, what's already in the ecosystem. That's actually another one of our principles. I find that, I mean, UNICEF's not a hardware manufacturer and our, our job is not to get new devices out into the world. And frankly, we don't have the support structure to be able to deal with getting new devices out, repair, replacement, powering them. So we really look around at what's already in the existing e ecosystem and try to use that and try to look at what people are already doing, you know, what their, their, pattern, their natural patterns already are, and try to work, work off of those. I think also... Um, Having some, building something and having something for people to respond to is really important. Talking about something in abstract is like, yeah, it'd be great to have you know, this new, crazy, awesome thing that does X, Y, and Z. And I, usually people, if you ask people, would you like this, they'll usually say yes. Right? Like, would you like this thing that's going to make your life easier? You know, people will automatically say yes. Yeah. But without actually trying it out, that yes doesn't, have, doesn't carry a lot of weight. Um, and so... Having a small, even if it's, you know, a not even a minimum viable product, but just something really simple for them to play around with, you will observe so much more than you than if you ask them in abstract. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. That reminds me of the stories about Doug Engelbart where he had a block of wood that he would carry around to show people what a mouse was like or what it could be. And it was just a block of wood, but it was uh, in the conversations and interactions with, with people, he was able to get them feeling or thinking about what it might look like and maybe watching how they might use it. So it could be as simple as that, a block of wood or a piece of foam or something. Yeah, totally. It doesn't need to be, you know, something that's fully functional yet, but there has to be something to react to. Or like a little, little drawing of a something on a card or something like that. Okay, so that is, yeah, and that and and the purpose of that is to give people a chance to play with it, feel what it might feel like to, to uh, so it's a, it could be a prototype of a even an interaction or something like that. Yeah, and like what we do is what we use because we're not bringing in you know extra hardware into people's lives. Like we're using the phones that they already own. We're like, okay, well, so we set up you know like a, a server like just with like a small you know modem like connected to a laptop. And we've set up, you know, a very simple system. We're like, okay, now um, you need to join the system and, you know, pretend that you're sending in this text message. And we get to see what happens and what breaks and what doesn't work. And, you know, we realize, for example, one of the, our biggest observations, and this was on an on earlier project, was um, essentially we were sending in data fields uh, by a text message. And... Um, you know, a natural way, I think, when yes, as a as a programmer, is to use underscore to sort of separate your your data fields, and that makes sense intuitively when you're on a computer, right? 
and it's you know it's really easy for the machine to read, and you know it's great. Have you ever tried to do that on a, a feature phone? I don't think I have. <laughs> it is impossible. Like if you can find the underscore <laughs> on a feature phone, like I will pay you a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah, no, that's uh, and that's a that's a nice that's a nice point because what you're doing you're talking about not only are you building something that people can respond to but you're actually uh, role playing the, the kinds of interactions as well as sort of like that that you would be having so you're you're almost doing kind of a walkthrough of mm -hmm. a of a process and then you 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 are finding out things that would be kind of like deal killers if you found them out after you built the whole thing. It could be kind of things that could be very expensive to fix later if you hadn't uncovered them in that early stage. Yeah, or you just have, like in that case, you just have to make usage, right? Because you whatever you find the underscore. Yeah, it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so do you have any, do you have any other stories? That that was a great one. I, I mean, I'm sure you have a bunch of them. What's a what's another story that you a success story of um, going into an environment where there are a lot of unknowns and coming out with something that you were proud of or feel happy about? So I can tell you about um, a company that's become incredibly successful now, but was a failure for so many years. And like, no matter how many try times we tried to kill this product, it just kept on coming back. Okay. Like our zombie project. Um, so, uh, but I'll tell I'll tell you a lot about what it is now. Okay. Essentially, um, I think one of the most exciting things that our team uh, has has been working on is a way to directly engage um, young people and have them contribute to to policy making, sort of at sort of the you know national government level. So, for example, in Uganda, we have a system called U-Report, which is actually built on the same technology that uh, this, the HIV project in Zambia was built on. It's a sort of framework called Rapid SMS. It's a framework for building mobile applications, essentially. And uh, it's, uh, so, so we, this, uh, so you report in uh, Uganda has 250,000 young people um, that get a SMS, a text message question every week. So they've joined, they, they joined through a short code, they press, they, they wrote join and they send it to a short code. And once a week they get a question. And the question can be on anything ranging from um, what is your view on corporal punishment in schools to are there drugs, uh, is, are there medicines and drugs uh, at yeah, the clinic? To, is the water point working? But there are, they're really about things ranging from people's beliefs and attitudes um, about the things that UNICEF cares about, so health, education, etc., to are government services that should be delivered actually being delivered. So based on what they answer, so let's say they were asked about, you know, is the water point working? And they, they wrote back, yes, it, it is working. Then the next question will be, like, well, what kind of water point is it? And, you know, we... Water, water point, you said? Like, where people get water. Okay, so like, it could be a pump or... It could be a, a well, it could be oh. a hand pump, it could be a river, it could be... And, like, you know, we want well or hand pump. A uh, river usually means unsafe water. Mm -hmm. So we want, like, sort of a closed water source. So based on that, we can see, because we have 250,000 young people all over the country, we can see sort of where people are, are not, don't have safe water, where pumps are broken, um, and we have a map of this that, you know, basically comes in once a week in real time. And we have, you know, location. Uh, we ask them, like, where they are when they first join. So we know where they are in the country. We age, we ask them their 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 age sort of range and then gender. And uh, this so that that's all fine and well, but I think what's really yeah cool that's cool that's really cool is that this is published in the newspaper. Why don't we have that in the U.S. <laughs> I know, right? So this is published in the newspaper. There's a radio show show about it, and there's also a TV show about it, and wow. all of the. Parliamentarians, so all the local government, they're all on the system, 
all, like the entire government is on the system, so they know what's going wrong with their constituents, and they also can advocate for you know more resources to say like, look, all of my constituents say X, Y, and Z. And we've actually have bills that are being brought before Parliament based on this information. For example, a bill on corporal punishment is before Parliament uh, right now because before it was really hard to find the data. Like, oh, it's not really a problem. It's you know we haven't outlawed it in schools, but you know we don't think it's a problem. And even if it is, like we don't really have the data on it. And this gives us you know that that information like instantaneously. And so I think. You know, the technology is, very, is like relatively simple, it's, but it's like the ability to hear from young people and like actually have young people really participate in, you know, what's, what's happening to them and their future and the services that they, they receive is the part that's so powerful. So that's the success. Well, that's, I mean, that's only part of what I think is powerful about it. I mean, you were, you were building across an entire nation a, a shared understanding of the, the state of the system that's being updated weekly and kind of sort of and for a, for a nation that's like real time that's um, you know and and it's, and it's not only is it a kind of a dashboard or some you know sort sort of a shared um, it's not only that it's an understanding it's that it's a shared understanding and that people all across the country are feeling like they're participating in it and it's feeding back to them in the form of like TV shows and uh, and Governments um, responding to things. I mean, that's that's powerful. Yeah, and we're you know all of sort of we have you know another forty countries lined up to like try to do that this year. I hope my country's on the list. <laughs> I don't know. You know, like this works better where there's only mobile technology <laughs> and also like simpler government structures. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll skip that. We'll we'll skip that. Put that in the parking lot. But, so, um, but you, but you, it took a. This is really not always a success. So this, yeah, so I, let's hear the story of, of how you got there. Okay, so in two thousand and eight, I think. Yeah, two thousand and eight. Maybe been two thousand seven even, but so a while ago. Mm -hmm. Um. We were approached by we being UNICEF, was approached by um, OLPC, One Laptop Per Child, and uh, Google, and StoryCorps. So essentially, StoryCorps, they have this great system where they have these booths all around the world where uh, people can go in and record their stories. And there's, a, there's someone who's a, there's an interviewer in the booth, and the, the, their story can be about Whatever they want it to be, but it's about their sort of personal story. And if, like, you know, they're they're um, on NPR all the time, and they're they're really they're highly edited, but they're really powerful individual stories. Um, and so that was their model. Uh, Google was sort of at the beginning of thinking how their engineers and their 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 staff could could give back, and you know what they could do with their you know their 10 percent time or like 5 percent time or however much percent time it was. And then one laptop per child was thinking it was going to be receiving all of these orders to have laptops all around the world. So they approached UNICEF because they wanted to get sort of the stories of young people out there. So we started this project uh, called Our Stories, and we uh, a lot of our principles actually came from. The failure of this. <laughs> okay. So it's essentially, it's the same idea as you report: is getting the, the voices of young people from all around, uh, you know, up on a map, out there. The main issue was that it didn't have any connection to, to government or policy change. Okay. Well, I mean, that was one of the issues. <laughs> and you know, so like, you put it on a map, but then what? Like, if there's no link to change. Or there's no sort of action that this generates, then you just you just have these random things on the map. Okay, so let's time out there. So what was the thought? Um, so it was it that the thinking just hadn't gone that far. It was, we had just thought, okay, we'll get the stories and we'll figure out what to do with them later. Or um, what was thinking at the time? I think to get this this all of this stuff to work because essentially, okay, well, I mean the the, the biggest. There were so many big problems. Another big problem was one laptop per child. It actually very. 
it's not a design, it's not a very, like, the, the outside's very well designed, but the software that ran inside it in 2008, it's not user-friendly. Like, you can't do things like copy-paste. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to go into command line to do that. So, like, you know, kids aren't going to do that. I mean, like, I know kids are smart and all that, but, like, if my programmers are telling me how difficult it is to use, <laughs> our kids are not going to use it either. Sure, okay. Um, also, they're just worth, you know, they thought that they were going to get millions and millions of orders and there would be all, there'd be OLPCs all around the world. That just never happened. Mm -hmm. Right? So, no hardware out there to record stories, no link to policy, terrible user interface, um, total failure as well. Yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I wonder if that, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it, it's interesting because you're talking about some, you know, a bunch of very well-intentioned people coming together trying to do, make a difference and, and really not, it's, there's no lack of uh, caring or wanting things to happen, but um, maybe it sounds like a lot, uh, maybe some assumptions that were just, you know. Definitely. Okay, so what, was the, what were the lessons that came out of that first iteration, that uh, first failure? Um, you have to be being dependent on hardware is too difficult. I mean, it's great if you're doing a, pilot, a small pilot program, but if you really want to do something at very, very large scale, you need to work with what's, what's out there because you, can, you, you can't afford and you can't, and it's too logistically complicated, too yeah. pricey, it doesn't work. Um, trying to take existing models that, uh, you know, StoryCorps had a model that worked very well, but, you know, it was a very in-depth interview. Like, if I was just going to tell you, tell me your story, Dave, like you'd be like, well, what do you mean? What part do you want to hear about? You can't just ask someone to, you can't just say, tell me your story and hold a microphone up to someone's. There has to be a curation and a uh, sort of a conversation and a dialogue. And so we found that, you know, these small questions that you could answer yes, no to um, were much easier than, you know, the completely open-ended questions about, like, tell me your life story. Okay, so just because a model, that's another idea that I'm taking away, just because a, just because a model works in one place doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere. Yeah, or you can't, like, we had, like, we were trying to bastardize an, an existing model and make it totally scalable, but obviously, you know, just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. um, so hardware, yeah, the model. Uh, yeah, actually, I, mean, I, I, I could see how... This would come up. I could. I'm starting to see how these thing, these pieces come together. Because if 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 you've just got ten or twenty or thirty or three hundred or three thousand just rambling long stories, how do you rationalize those across? Yeah, and what are they used for? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I think the, the things you have to have. A, people need to want to participate, and they have to understand why they're participating. And I don't think we have that at all. Um, like we thought, like, oh, it'd be great to have all these stories, but if there isn't sort of some sort of action that they can get behind that comes out of it, um, I think in, in, in the case of Uganda, it's very clear, right? This is a direct path to have a say in what's happening in Parliament. And you, and all for all the parliamentarians, it's like, this is what my constituents think, and this is what they feel. And yeah, that's very different than someone coming from a some kind of foreign aid mm -hmm. organization just telling me they want to hear my story, isn't it? I mean, that's radically different. Yeah, it's like why, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so you could go back and tell all the white people my story. <laughs> yeah, it's like so weird, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think yeah. Um, you have to find context and context for the for the users about like why they're doing this and why it's why it's important to their lives and. Um, otherwise, they won't use it. But. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a great insight. I mean, I think that, uh, and it makes perfect sense when you say it. And it, especially, you know, and I think that it's a good thing for people who want, are trying to help other people also. 
you know, to ask yourself the question, why would they want this <laughs> help? <laughs> like, why, how does this improve their daily life, right? Yeah. Like, make their life easier or make their life, like, I mean, we're trying to do, you know, to do policy change around, you know, health issues. It's not exactly like prime time entertainment. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I think polio is exciting, but not most, most people don't, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so okay, so um, so you, how did can you can you help me understand the steps that went from the sort of the large scale failure to the the steps that got you to where you, it is today? Because I mean, it's really come a long way, hasn't it? Yeah. So um, uh, the biggest step I think was that um, a lot of my team moved to Uganda. Okay. So, so you know, for example, my um, my my boss at the time, who really gave uh, gave gave me and my colleague Chris the space to like develop and try all these cool new things, he went to go become the country director of uh, of, of UNICEF Uganda, and he um, took some of my team uh, with him because. And so we still all work together, but you know we, he would we, they would have sort of they would do the development directly where you know the challenges were not in New York but in but in Uganda. Well, that's a, that's and a thing that's it's, that's a, that so seems to be a common key. But the other thing was they weren't trying to say solve a global problem like oh let's have the voices of young people everywhere. They were trying to solve, okay, well, what makes sense in the context of Uganda? And because they had this sort of boxed-in thing that they were looking at, or a much more defined problem, they were actually able to build something that was relevant, and they weren't trying to do the entire world to start with. I mean, they knew that whatever they were building would, you know, they wanted to be able to be replicable in other contexts, which it is. You know, we're, it's, it's already going in a couple of countries, and, you know, we have a lot more that want to come online. But they, they built something that was for that place and for that time, keeping scalability and, you know, other countries in mind, but really solving a problem that was, uh, that was, that was there. Is that one of the principles that, is that told me he was resurrecting our stories? I was like, Shara, please no. It was such a failure. Don't do this. Don't do this. But I was wrong. <laughs> well what what made him decide that he wanted to resurrect this thing? Oh, it was like a zombie. He kept on wanting to resurrect it and I kept on being like, No, we failed so terribly. Don't don't let's not like this is not gonna work. So he believed he had he believed in something though. There was something he felt that there was something there. Yeah, I think, you know, the vision that we all shared, uh, especially at the beginning, I, I was a doubter, I guess, for a couple of years along the way, but the vision that we all shared um, was that we wanted to have, to have, for young people to have a voice in the decisions that were being made about their lives. And um, we wanted it to be n not just tokenistic, but actually meaningful. I think one thing that often see um, is young people sort of being paraded in front of leaders and being like, oh, what do you think? Or, you know, and that's supposed to be the input of all youth everywhere, which clearly it isn't. Mm -hmm. And we wanted something that just wasn't a one-off, but something uh, like a new way for young people to engage with, with government. Is, um, that one of, uh, is that one of your principles and now? And I think that... Sorry. What's changed since Sorry, there's a bit of a lag, so I can't. Yeah, no, I I'm, I apologize. Okay, I think what's also what's changed since you know 2007 and 2008 is we're seeing that when you do have a disaffected youth, um, things like the Arab Spring happen. So I think for governments, they're much more receptive to to this as well. So one question I have is this: this idea is very intriguing to me that 
Uh, if you try and solve too big of a problem or is trying to solve something on a global scale that you, uh, you're you sort of setting yourself up for failure, it's like biting off more than you can chew in a way. Um, but it's if you can start with a smaller problem that's local and contextual but keeps the idea that you will, might want to scale it in mind as you look at that, that you have a better chance of success. Is that one of your, is that, do you have a principle that's related to that? Is that, because um, it sounds like a, a principle to me. <laughs> Can you hear me? Try to take a global. Oh, yeah, we had a little technical glitch there. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I, I can hear you. Back now. Can you hear <laughs> yeah, me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we had some kind of internet glitch. Uh, I was just asking you if that was a, if that was yeah. one of your principles. This idea of smaller things being easier to define, uh, and starting starting small and then scaling. Um, it's not necessarily the, it's, well, I mean, our principles are designing for scale. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like employing a systems approach, like making sure that um, you're replicable, demonstrating impact before you scale, um, and building for sustainability. I think the, the thing that probably gets the starting small is the designing with the user. You can't design with like 50 million users. You have to start with just a couple. Yeah, and also this, the idea of demonstrating impact before you scale seems connected to that as well. It's like a, you want to start in a, just by designing with, with people who are in a particular context for a particular use and demonstrate that you, you know, and there's something in there that's about, you know, not wasting a lot of energy and resources before you know that something's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry about this internet problem. I don't know if it's my end or, or yours. You're in New York. Right. And I, I'm in St. Louis, so it's probably more likely to be me. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, do you have any? Um, do you have any other stories that you you can uh, you can tell? That, that, I mean, you, uh, I, these are fantastic. That sort of illustrates some of the principles. Mm -hmm. um, or just favorite stories of things that you've you've accomplished. I mean, you've had you've. These are some amazing successes, I think. Um, just curious if you have any more you'd like to share. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. More more failures. More failures, yeah. I got a lot of those. <laughs> um. Well, really, I mean, let me, let me ask you another way. Um, in the time that you've been doing this, what were some of your big, your biggest aha moments? Some of the biggest things that you were like, "Oh wow, I never, I never," you know, kind of big learning moments for you. Um, okay, maybe I'll go on to sort of talk about developing. I think this is someone who comes from sort of a very agile and design-driven um, place. And I think one thing that I've really learned, I think probably the hard way, is that if you can't align the incentives of the big players that you need at scale, that you're just really, they would see the data and like, they would be like, oh my gosh, well clearly we have to like figure out, you know, strengthen this or invest more in this or stop doing that, that's not working. And I thought that they would use the data. Um, right, but there was a bureaucratic status quo. But they do, yeah. Right. <laughs> and I don't think it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't because they felt that data was bad or anything. They just, it wasn't the culture. 
So yeah. how do you go about shifting that? How what can you do when that's a couple? Well, that takes time. I think is is uh, you know people can learn to do things differently, but it does take time and it takes you can't be the leader in that. You have to identify another person in that group that can be that needs to be the leader on this and to, to lead by example. There's no way as an outsider, like I'm not from the Ministry of Health, like I don't even work in these stuff a lot, right? right. That, to push that. There has so you to build that. a, you build some co coalition or some mm -hmm. network of people who are, you know, you start to build momentum towards change. Yeah, and that takes a lot of time. It's usually political, um, and you have to find champions from within the people who you are trying to change. Um, I think you know another thing I see is like I work a lot with the with the private sector, and they will often want to work with UNICEF like through their public social responsibility program, and they want to pay for a one-off pilot or they want to make some investment one time, right? Mm -hmm. And honestly, unless there's like something that I can identify, which is like you know just X amount of dollars and it's not going to need continued investment. I don't really like to work with them because I just don't feel it's very, very sustainable or very productive, productive, you know, for like the health system or education system or whatever sector we're working in in the long run. However, I think that if you can figure out how to um, sort of align your target audience or target market and sort of core business strategy with social good. It, and it's very hard to do, and it takes a really long time of getting to know each other, and you know what, what relationships. Like you know, I need to know what drives you and your company and your business, and you need to know the same about me. And then maybe we can figure out something. Maybe not, but maybe we can figure out something that works for all of us. And I think that that's, for me, that's a really really interesting space. And. I think I, in the past, maybe I've tried to do that, but I didn't really fully under, I didn't take, take enough time, or I didn't fully understand what was driving their business, even though I thought I did. So I thought our incentives were aligned, but they, probably, but they in reality probably weren't, and therefore things like don't necessarily pan out. However, I have been in situations where incentives, uh, our incentives really do do align, and then it's. Um, like really magical partnerships. So for example, um, I'm actually in San, hours. in San Francisco. I work. That's my computer. Okay. <laughs> that is, yeah. So I end my meetings on time. <laughs> in San Francisco, we're working out of our partner uh, Frog Designs offices, and they've been a great partner uh, of ours for for many years. And they've given us a tremendous amount of um, of, of pro bono work, but they're in a particular area, and that matches up with the areas that they're that's good for their core business. So, sure. for, for, so for example, they're, they're, some of their biggest clients are the healthcare industry, and also uh, technology, especially mobile companies. So, working with UNICEF in in emerging markets is a really good sort of Sign it shows their their clients that you know they are not just U.S. and European based um, or or you know developed markets based. They also they are, they are gaining experience in emerging markets, which is where their clients also want to go. With when with customers that are um, where where their their clients want to go as well. So how uh, how do you know the difference between I think I'm aligned, and I think I know what their motivations are, and I know what their motivations are. He's, he's, you, you. So, so with Frog Design, we, we talked for about, we are like, yes, we want to work together. We need to find the thing that makes sense. And we spent about a year and a half to two years talking about what would actually make sense. Okay. And we finally aligned. Actually, the first time we aligned was for that project in Zambia, the eight-week okay. eight uh, project in Zambia, where they sent uh, some of their team to look at 
not, not the initial eight weeks, but six months after we started, looking at uh, some of the design practices and what would it mean to scale, scale our system nationwide. Um, and so, you know, so essentially they, they show that they're, they're, they're main clients, that they, they're on this, they have insights into emerging markets and to the target audience that they're working for. Um, and so that places them above competitors. Also because all of our work, a lot of the work that they do for clients never, either never sees the light of day or they're not allowed to say that they worked on it at all because they're one of the really big corporate clients. All of the work that they do with us is in the public domain and they can advertise about it. They can put it up for design awards and we, you know, one of design awards together. Yeah. And that's really great visibility for, for the other clients. So that's really right. figuring out where that sweet spot is and how to work together. You know, they, they're a consulting-based organization, so like we can't have one of their staff on call for like six months. It's much better to have a small team for two weeks and intensive, you know, while, while they're not working on another major client project. And so just figuring out those subtleties, I think it's, and that's just relationship. Yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, and that's that's a common theme in some of the other stuff that you're talking about it with people that you're uh, trying to help and so forth is to to take the time, spend time with them, the people that you want to do work with, whether it's as a customer or as a partner. Um, take the time to build that rich, deep understanding of what's motivating them, what they what they get out of it, and then make do uh, find those sp sweet spots and subtleties where you can create alignment. Um, that's a that sounds like it's uh, uh, long and uh, it sounds like it's a, you can put a lot of energy and work into something like that sometimes without reward, right? I mean, it's a absolutely, <clears throat> yeah. But actually, having those having our principles there at the beginning in front of any partner from the get go actually eliminates a lot of people and therefore time. So our principles are like they're on our website and we. Uh, there's nine of them, and usually the ones that we oh, automatically eliminate a lot of technology companies are is like we when we're deploying systems, we only use open source products. Mm -hmm. And so, like you know, for example, Nokia is always like, oh, we really want to work with UNICEF, and you know, we want to work on our off of like these Nokia phones, and we're like, well. That's not going to work for us because, you know, we can't get in there and change things if we need to a year from now, six months down the line. And what we learn here, we won't necessarily be able to just take, give the code to someone other country and have them replicate it. So I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so having the principles on, having your, knowing what your principles are and also um, the uh, whatever other organizations you're working with, the more that you can, the more that they can reveal about their own principles, or the more that you can understand about their principles, uh, that helps you greatly in terms of just narrowing the field. Totally, yeah. And so then, then, then you're like, okay, well, we can't work together now. Yeah. Like maybe in a year or so, things will have shifted. Let's try them. But it cuts out so much time, and I found mm -hmm. that to be very, very useful. And then you get to spend that time with people who are more likely to be a good. Exactly. Fit. Yeah. Wow, great. Okay, well, so a lot of it, really, a lot of it is about, this seems to be about relationships, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Building relationships, listening to people, uh, trying to figure out what's good for them, a uh, little bit of educating people, a little bit of building, uh, building internal, uh, sort of building uh, momentum around um, <clears throat> getting internal champions and, and that kind of thing, internal leaders. So building alliances. Uh, so sounds like there's some politics. I mean... Uh, you do work for a huge organization, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this has been awesome. I mean, do you have any other great stories? <laughs> I wish I had better questions, but your stories are so fantastic. Um, let's see. I'm thinking about agility. 
Well, what about, I mean, um, have you have you done any work in areas where there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I know you've probably talked a little bit about this, but specifically dealing with uh, people that are in conflict, where there is conflict, and you have, um, and it's relatively deep, and you have to be either working within the boundaries of that or trying to help to resolve that? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't personally so much, but uh, like we, we have uh, uh, someone on our team who is uh, looks specifically at innovation and emergencies, and he has worked in uh, in Syria and in the Philippines, you know, following the, the typhoon last year, and he was in, based in Pakistan for um, for a number of years, and. I mean, if you would like me to put you in touch with him, I'd be more than happy to. I think oh, I would. definitely would. But just in case he says no, <laughs> what can you tell me about uh, about the stuff that um, he? Uh, what can you tell me about what he's doing, or what the kind of things that's happening there? So, um, one of the biggest challenges for UNICEF, not just UNICEF, but I think all um, sort of humanitarian organizations during emergencies, is very complicated, too much, and conflicting information. Mm-hmm, yeah. Especially, uh, you don't know, often it's very hard to figure out who, um, where, how many, right. and like, like basic things like that, right, that you would normally have, um, on like census data, right? You're like, how many beneficiaries are there? Like, how much of a problem is clean water? Uh, right. And so, just trying to figure out. So, so there's a whole practice or field of work called information management in emergencies. Mm. And this is, you know, obviously like all the technologies that you can use to capture this information, whether it's cell phones, mapping, you know drones, whatever, you name it, right? But it's also about how do we agree upon what the indicators are. So when we're all, you know, when all 800 NGOs that are out there are trying to capture this information, we're capturing it in a way that you could actually bring the information together in something that makes sense. Um, so I think that there's a, you have to be, because it's an emergency, you have to be agile, but I think they are also discovering their principles and their sort of core things, because you, you, you have multiple actors all trying to work towards the same goal. And so things get very messy. So you want to have, so you want to, basically, it sounds to me, if I understand you right, it's, you want to have, in advance of the emergency, agreed upon a certain set of standards for um, protocols, for how you're going to communicate things, how you're going to count things, how you're going to take... How do you delineate a boundary of a... Like, all these things should be in place before, before an emergency happens. And, like, there's a lot of work that's been done to get to that point, and, you know, much of it is. Um, so there's that, I think. But then on the other end... When you have so much money passing through, it's not even just like an issue of corruption, but how do you know the stuff that you're doing is getting to the people who actually need it? Like once you figure out who is where and what and when and all that. Right. And how do you ensure that they're not only getting it, but that you know their well-being is sort of being tracked over time, right? Because it's not like a, like, oh, here's water, and then, like, okay, you're fine, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it's, you know, for example, one of the things that, uh, one technology that, that my team's built is um, this thing called sort of, it's like when, when an emergency happens, whether it's natural or man-made, um, children often get separated from their caregivers or, or their families, you know, in commotion, after a natural disaster, you know, running for, for their lives, etc. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you know, there's, they're much more vulnerable to, to trafficking, to being abused, to, or just not, you know, not getting to school, not getting, you know, not getting sort of the services that they need. 
So one of the things uh, we developed was this way to uh, register them using an Android phone, right? So what used to happen is there would be all of this paper, which is like carbon copy paper. Like, let's say you're the child. I take down information about you, like your first name, your last name, what your parents' name are, the last time you saw them, where you're from, all this information. I take a photo of you, right? And then at, all, at some point later, all of this needs to be uploaded into the database, right? Mm -hmm. So someone then manually has to type it all in. So essentially what we built was a way to do this all on an Android phone, and it goes directly to the database. And essentially what we're trying to do is register them, make sure that they are safe and, safe and we know where they are, and et cetera, but also to eventually to reunite them with a family or caregiver. Right? And so in the Philippines when we were doing this, um, this was after the typhoon, so power was like there was no power, no electricity. So essentially what we did was we, um, it was really Mac who was, who was the, the guy who was our team who was, who was doing this, he got together a bunch of um, developers who were all, like, the mayor was having, like, some sort of tech camp right before the typhoon hit. So he got them all together, and he's like, okay, we have to figure out how to charge these cell phones to register these kids. So they, they rigged together something which would allow them to, like, charge off of, um, off of, car batteries, because there were cars strewn everywhere and their batteries were still fine. And then they also, you know, he trained them on the, on the whole system, um, but I think, you know, his observations was that it's total chaos, things are moving all the time. How do you take, like, because we developed a system in, uh, in southern Sudan uh, for, you know, the, the crisis there, and then we brought it to the Philippines and you know, it'll be used in the next emergency. So how do you take the system and bring it from one place to another in a completely chaotic situation? <coughs> yeah, well, I was going to ask you, how do you, if you're trying to build something for emergencies, you don't want to, do, you know, this whole idea of testing things and doing them in small pilots, you can't really do that in an emergency, right? You don't, you don't have time to do iterative testing necessarily over eight weeks, right? Well, we did do this with this. We tested it um, through a sustained emergency, which is sort of the South Sudan, Uganda, DRC border. Okay. And so we tested it there um, for a couple months before we brought it to the Philippines. So there are emergencies that just go on that long. That <laughs> years and years and years, yeah. That's, uh, that's sad. Uh, but the other thing that I, you, you, another one of your principles just came up in that one too, which is this idea of building on what's already there, right? I mean, what's there? Car batteries. Mm -hmm. And what's there? There was just a tech conference. So, you know, it's like we got the geeks and we got brains and, you know, so it sounds like uh, he was applying a lot of those principles that you were talking about earlier, is just building on what's there. And I can imagine in an emergency situation, that is going to be kind of what you're going to have to do because you're going to have only have access to what you have access to, right? Yeah. No, we we get all we make all team members get them tattooed on their arms. <laughs> wow. Well, this has been wonderful. Yeah, look down. What's that? I said, in case you forget, just look down. <laughs> well, so uh, is there anything else that that I haven't asked you that you'd like to share with people about um, uh, how to uh, innovate in Difficult environments. Um, or just anything else you'd like to share at all? I think I mean one of the things that's sort of innovating and difficult is finding your um, finding people who are like you because it's you're you're trying to work against you know against a very very big slow moving system or you're trying to do something that's you know incredibly challenging where uh, it's, it's you know the goal is so big and you're trying to change you know change the world essentially. Finding your your tribe or you know the people who, who are like you uh, who are also trying to do this thing I think has been uh, the most valuable and useful thing uh, to me. And it's doing it by yourself is impossible. And not having yeah. feedback and sort of discussions about where you went wrong and how you went wrong and you know sort of that empathy exchanged and, you know, those, those ideas exchanged, I think 
you wouldn't be able to get very far. That's a beautiful thought because uh, you can't do it alone. And the idea of um, shared passion, uh, and you know, it's also come up in a lot of these interviews for me that's been sort of uh, really seems very foundational is that you can't really do this if people don't care. That people actually yeah. have to, um, you know, people actually have to care about what they're doing. And this is not language that we're used to using at work, a lot of us. I mean, we're used to the language. <laughs> We're just not used to actually caring. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting though. So, I mean, I work in a in a field where um, it's not really driven by profit, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't make very much money, and like my my job is not to generate profit. So, I think that it's you have to look at it from different from very very different angles, and I think. Um, Utility is, you know, personal utility to whoever's using it, whether it's using using a, a product or, you know, a system, I think is probably uh, one of the key drivers. Well, thank you so much, Erica. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you today. I, I, I really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Yeah, I will uh, put you in touch with Mac if you want to you know more yeah, about Yeah, for sure. So let me just... Um, <laughs> Uh, remind people, my name is Dave Gray. I've been talking to Erica Kochi. Kochi? Kochi, yeah. Kochi. Um, she's co-founder and co-lead of the UNICEF's innovation team. She's, uh, you can find out more about her at unicefstories.org. And also, uh, she's on Twitter at Erica Kochi, K-O-C-H-I. Uh, it's been really a pleasure. Thank you for being with us today, Erica. Thanks very much, Dave. Bye now.